Cool pad. Um, so we are in the last week of classes. Next week is finals. I have posted the final exam online in Blackboard. It's the exact same format as the midterm, four short essay questions, open book, etc., etc. Any questions on that? No? Okay. Um, so it'll be due a week from today in Blackboard. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any questions from last Tuesday's lecture? Uh, since it wasn't live, do you guys have any questions about it? No? Everyone's good? Okay. All right. Um, so we are going to talk about foreign policy for two reasons. One, most of you will probably never take an intro to international relations course. So it's good to know a little bit about how we interact with the world. And also, it's my favorite chapter. So I get to pick it. Um, so we're going to talk today about a couple different types of policy, as well as some of the actors who are involved in setting our foreign policy. Okay, so foreign policy is essentially all of the ways we interact with the rest of the world through diplomacy, military and security, human rights, and economics. So we'll use any combination of these to interact with other countries like China or the UK or Saudi Arabia. And the biggest foreign policy makers are the President, Congress, and bureaucracies like Defense and State Department and the CIA. Constitutionally speaking, the President has the advantage over Congress in terms of setting foreign policy. The President is our chief diplomat. Um, makes treaties, recognizes ambassadors, and so on. So in this area, the president does have more power than Congress, does have more authority to set foreign policy. Unlike domestic policy, there is pretty strong competition to figure out who gets to set foreign policy. You have competition between interest groups, the political parties, experts, and so on. You want to be the one to help figure out how we're going to interact with Iran or try to negotiate a peace agreement between Israel and another country in the Middle East, or push for us to go to war against another country. So there's a lot of competition over who's going to help set foreign policy, who's going to persuade the president to see a certain point of view. So is there any of you political science majors? No? Okay. Okay. All right. So one of the biggest areas of foreign policy is security. Um, security at home and abroad. Traditionally, throughout most of the 20th century, we were concerned with other nations, Nazi Germany, 
the Soviet Union, North Korea, and so on. But we wanted to shift away from focusing on states to focusing on non-state actors. Non-state actors are groups other than recognized nations that try to play a role in the international system, try to shape policy or influence events. 9-11 was carried out by a non-state actor, Al-Qaeda. Now, while they were mostly based in Afghanistan, they were not a formally recognized government. And ISIS also is a non-state actor. They don't have an established formal territory. So we've had to shift the way we look at foreign policy to be more concerned with issues like ter terrorism, um, hacking of computers, bio threats, and so on. And then we have to be more concerned about a guy ramming a car through a crowded street than we have to be about North Korea. So foreign policy is constantly having to shift and evolve with new threats. And from the late 1700s through roughly the 1930s, the policy of the United States was to stay the hell out of the global community. We didn't want to get involved in other conflicts, in other fights. Occasionally, we'd step in to try and promote peace. But by and large, the attitude of the US was, not our circus, not our monkey. We're staying out of this one. We did briefly get involved in World War I. But afterwards, our attitude was, well, we really didn't need to get involved. This wasn't our fight. Why should we intervene when Europe goes to war with each other? But over time, of course, it became abundantly clear that this policy wasn't going to work. Just because we ignored the world didn't mean the world was going to ignore us. And so we learned that lesson after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. It then became clear that we were going to have to step into the global realm. We were going to have to be willing to use our military as necessary. So we went from isolation to intervention in some ways. Um, we began to realize that even if we wanted to sit on the sidelines, that didn't mean that people weren't going to come after us. I'm sure some of this is familiar from your history classes, right? Yeah, yeah. And to be fair, we did try after World War I to create an international body, the League of Nations, but we never even joined it. So that pretty much said that's not going to work, right? You can't even get the U.S. to join. That's not going to work. Um, so we did actually then create the United Nations after World War II. Um, so it's not like there wasn't an attempt. It just didn't really work. So after World War II, our focus became paying attention to Soviet Union. Um, we didn't want the Soviet Union taking over the world. So our approach to the Soviet Union was a mixture of two different policies, containment and appeasement. Containment was when we used our power to try and keep the Soviet Union in check. Um, for example, when the Soviet Union blockaded Berlin, us dropping food to help keep the people from starving, dividing Berlin into East and West Germany, um, stepping up to try and prevent them from taking over 
parts of Latin America, Africa, and so on. We did also engage in a bit of appeasement. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis ended when we agreed to pull our missiles out of Turkey, and they agreed to pull their missiles out of Cuba, and both sides got what they wanted. So sometimes we'd negotiate, um, try and keep it from reaching an all-out war. So it's called a Cold War because we never went directly to war with the Soviet Union. We came close a few times, but we never went to war directly with them. Instead, we did kind of fight proxy wars. The Korean War, for example. The USSR was backing the communists in North Korea. We were backing the people of South Korea. So we were able to force a stalemate um, with what is now North and South Korea and the militarized zone between them. We also fought in Vietnam to try and prevent the spread of communism. That wasn't as successful because once we left Vietnam, the North overran the South and the country became communist anyway. But on occasion, we would go toe to toe with the Soviet Union in countries like um, Angola or Vietnam, um, the Congo, and so on. And the main reason we never went directly to war with the Soviet Union was because of the policy of mutually assured destruction. Some of you heard of this theory, or this policy. Not really? Okay. Mutually assured destruction is if two countries are well matched in terms of military and weaponry, neither of them can win without significant losses. We have nuclear weapons. So did the Soviet Union. If we had dropped a nuclear bomb on Moscow, they could drop a nuclear bomb on Washington, D.C., and neither side wins. So because we were so well matched, we weren't willing to go to war and destroy both countries, because no matter who ended up winning in this conflict, neither country was going to come through without deaths in the millions easily. Um, so mutually assured destruction prevents two equally matched countries from wanting to go to war with each other. It's why there's so much attention paid to India and Pakistan when they keep going back and forth towards war, because both countries have nuclear weapons, so it could get bad really quickly. There are seven recognized nuclear powers in the world. Us, France, China, Russia, the UK, India, and Pakistan. Israel has neither confirmed nor denied that they have a nuclear weapon. They're not going to deny it because if one of the surrounding countries gets the bright idea to attack them, well, they don't want them thinking, okay, well, it's going to be easy to take over Israel. Um, so whether or not they have them, it's unclear. Um, I'm leaning towards they do, they just don't want to say it. So there might be an eighth nuclear power in the world. Okay, prior to 9-11, the attitude of the United States fell into the rational actor models. Let me type that in here. Okay, the rational actor model is based on two premises. One, any adversary has to know that the U.S. will respond with force if attacked. Two, 
that they rationally assess the costs and risks of attacking us. Here's the problem with this model. It does not work with terrorists. Terrorism is not rational. Terrorists don't care what happens after they attack. All they care about is succeeding. I guarantee you none of the hijackers on 9-11 gave a damn what happened afterwards. They just wanted to succeed. Terrorist groups operate on the premise that they attack and then they leave. And it's a lot harder to go after a terrorist group if the terrorists disappear. So they are not rational by nature. You cannot interact with a non-state actor the same way you would with a country. So we've had to rethink this rational actor model. Because again, terrorism is not rational by nature. So President Bush decided to switch to a policy of preventive war. He gave a speech and he basically told the world, look, if we're feeling threatened, we're going to strike first. Strike first, ask questions later. And he made it clear that he was not going to rule out the threat of war against North Korea or Iran. So he basically told the global community, if you threaten us, we will hit you, and it will not be pretty. President Obama, on the other hand, um, kind of shifted away from this. He preferred to use sanctions and diplomacy first and military last. He didn't want to get involved in another conflict. Um, he had to make an exception, of course, for ISIS, but by and large, he didn't want to go to war again. But we had some issues dealing with conflicts in Syria and Russia kind of meddling. Um, the Syrian civil war has been going on for almost a decade. It started as an attempt to overthrow the dictator Bashar al-Assad. Um, we intervened to help the rebels try to overthrow Assad. Russia intervened to help Assad stay in power. And because that wasn't chaotic enough, into the void steps ISIS. So now you've got three different factors working in Syria. You've got ISIS-controlled territory, government-controlled territory, rebel-controlled territory. We were able to work with Russia to try to push ISIS out of Syria. But Russia has made it clear that they will back Assad until the very end, despite the fact that he has dropped chemical weapons on his people and has deliberately blown up hospitals, schools, and other no-go zones. Um, so what should have been an attempt to overthrow a violent dictator has turned into a bit of a conflict with Russia. We also saw in the Obama administration the lifting of sanctions on Iran that had been put into place when Iran started working on nuclear weapons. Because they were holding up their end of the bargain for the most part, um, President Obama lifted the economic sanctions. President Trump came into office and said, I don't trust the Iranians, we're putting the sanctions back into place. So they put new economic sanctions on Iran, and Iran said, fine, we'll go back to developing nuclear bombs, because if you're going to punish us for something we haven't done, you might as well go ahead and do it, right? If your parents are going to ground you for a party that you're not even going to, why not go ahead and just go to the party, right? It just doesn't make sense to say, well, we're going to punish you for something you aren't doing, because then all you do is encourage them to do the very thing you don't want them to do. Um, it's too early to tell what President-elect Biden will do with this. Um, in all likelihood, he will probably look at lifting the sanctions, assuming Iran is willing to go back to the original terms of the agreement, which isn't a guarantee. Okay, a 
Another major foreign policy area is economic policy. We are a member of the World Trade Organization, or the WTO, as it's known. The WTO was established in 1995 with the idea of promoting global free trade. The world is shrinking in some ways. You can get products from China in less than a week. Um, international trade is easier than it's ever been. So the goal of the WTO is to make it easier for goods and products to move across global markets. For us to be able to buy jewelry from Kenya or um, dog toys from China, things like that. We're also, of course, part of the North American Free Trade Agreement, although that is being renegotiated. Um, that's the trade treaty we entered into with Canada and Mexico to reduce the tariffs and increase trade between the three countries. Um, it's why when you're driving along the border, you see all of those trucks coming back and forth. That's a lot of the trade that's going back and forth. Now, the WTO is good in theory, but not so good in practice. Um, they have a tendency to not look at the needs of poor countries. They also tend to overlook human rights abuses like forced labor, um, child labor, and environmental damage. So they haven't been as good at calling out countries like China who routinely violate human rights laws. They've also been bad about trying to help poor countries get generic drugs um, so they can help with things like HIV, malaria, and so on. There's also been concern about the government here, but also in Europe, placing heavy subsidies on agriculture. Subsidies are not a bad thing. Subsidies help farmers when they have a bad year. If there's a drought or a hurricane or so on, subsidies keep farmers in business. They allow them to continue to operate. The problem is that we still provide subsidies even in the good years. So what happens is American farmers can afford to put their products on the global market at such cheap prices that other countries cannot compete with us. Countries in Africa can't compete with us in terms of selling things like sugar, um, cotton, wheat, and so on. We've basically made it a lot harder for poorer countries to compete on the global market. In Kenya, it's cheaper to buy canned tomatoes from the Netherlands than it is from Kenya. So, well intentioned, but very harmful in terms of helping poor countries to be able to afford to sell their products on the market. And of course, there's also issues with the fact that a lot of jobs have been outsourced. 2.8 million manufacturing jobs were lost in the early 2000s, and they are not coming back. We've also seen an uptick in IT jobs disappearing. So if you call Dell for support, what country are you reaching? India, right? You're probably reaching someone in India. Uh, most of the call centers have relocated because they don't have to pay a minimum wage. Or if they do, it's significantly cheaper compared to the United States. Um, there's a lot of people who are like, well, what the hell am I supposed to do now, right? I worked at this company for 20 years, and then you sent my job to Mexico. How am I supposed to come back from that?
another area of foreign policy that isn't as big, but is still very important, is humanitarian policy. We are the signatory to some international treaties um, on the environment, but we didn't sign on to the Paris Accords, and we withdrew from the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. Part of the problem is that there's a disagreement between elected officials over climate change. We have some government officials who say it's not real. So of course, they're not necessarily going to be willing to enter into an environmental treaty if they don't think it's a problem. We are a party to a lot of human rights treaties like the 1948 Genocide Convention, um, conventions on the prohibition of using child soldiers in war, and the Geneva Conventions, which are concerned with how we interact with enemy combatants in war. Despite the fact that we are signatory to a lot of treaties, we tend to focus more on economic policy over human rights policy. We do not call out our major trading partners on their human rights abuses. We don't criticize Saudi Arabia for beating women in public or executing people with a sword. Um, like a year ago, a couple of young men were crucified in public for acts of terrorism or when Saudi Arabia kidnapped a journalist in an embassy and killed him. We didn't really say much about that. Why? Well, they're one of our biggest trading partners, where we get a lot of our oil. We also don't call out China for locking workers into buildings, for the fact that they are committing genocide against a minority Muslim group in China. We're not going to say much about that because we're not going to risk our economic relationship. So we'll call out countries like North Korea, with whom we have no ties, but we're very cautious to say anything about China, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and so on. We do help provide humanitarian aid where we can. We've spent a little over $5 billion trying to help other countries with the Syrian refugee crisis. We sent medical aid, food, and rescue teams to Haiti after their devastating 2010 earthquake, and Japan after their earthquake and tsunami in 2011. Um, we've also spent $300 million in humanitarian aid helping South Sudan with uh, famine. So if there's an earthquake, a famine, a natural disaster, we do tend to send at least supplies, if not financial assistance. But there have been some questions about our refugee policy. Prior to 9-11, our refugee policy was a bit more generous. We took in a large number of young people from Sudan called the Lost Boys and Girls of Sudan. South Sudan, before it became independent, fought a 30-year civil war with the North. North Sudan is mostly uh, Muslim, South Sudan is mostly Christian. So the children were fleeing a conflict and having to walk hundreds of miles to Ethiopia and Kenya. Um, and so evangelicals in the U.S. were able to persuade the president to allow these children into the United States. That policy ended after 9-11. We've become a lot stricter with our refugee policy. It can take the better part of two years for someone to be allowed to resettle in the United States. They do have to go through extensive background checks, fingerprints, and so on. Um, so it is fairly tricky to come to the U.S. as a refugee. And there's been a lot of comments about the lack of Syrian refugees that we have been taking in. Terrorism, of course, is understandably 
something we have to be concerned about. Um, but there's a lot of back and forth about should we be taking in more refugees or not. That's still up in the air. Any questions on Any questions online? So now we're going to talk about the various actors in foreign policy. Again, constitutionally speaking, the president does have the most foreign policy power. He can make treaties and he can choose to accept ambassadors. He can also decide, help decide if the United States is going to recognize a newly independent country. So when South Sudan got its independence, in 2011, the president then helped decide to recognize it as a legitimate country. However, most presidents do not have foreign policy experience prior to entering office. There are some exceptions. Um, president George H.W. Bush had been head of the CIA before becoming vice president. So he was an exception to the rule. Most presidents, though, they work on domestic policy. So they have to learn foreign policy very quickly. And this was especially the case with President George W. Bush. Less than eight months into his presidency, 9-11 happened. So now he has to completely refocus on foreign policy. He has to find a way to respond to the worst act of terrorism in American history. So he shifted our foreign policy back to national security, um, created the Department of Homeland Security, and so on. And he was willing to engage in unilateral action in the Middle East. He didn't have a lot of global support for the war in Iraq. So basically, President Bush told the world, look, you're with us or you're against us. And if you're against us, get out of the way. President Obama, on the other hand, was more willing to work with our allies. Um, we were part of a NATO mission in 2011 to remove Muammar Gaddafi from power in Libya, um, which was successful in removing him, but not in solving the ongoing conflict there. He also wanted to withdraw the troops from Afghanistan and Iraq, or at least draw them down. Um, and he was president when the military was finally able to find and kill Osama bin Laden. He did want to use the military less, but with the rise of ISIS, he did understand that we were going to have to get involved. Um, push ISIS out of Iraq, um, Syria, and so on. Um, so he did send troops to help try to fight ISIS um, and a little bit to help fight against Boko Haram in Nigeria. Um, so he didn't get to withdraw as many troops as he wanted. Um, he ended up having to send some uh, back in to try and help get rid of the threat of ISIS.
In terms of some of the bureaucracies, um, the major foreign policy actors include the Secretaries of State, Defense, and Treasury, which makes sense. If we're going to go to war, we're going to need the Defense Department and Treasury on board with it. Also, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Director of the CIA. So all of them are going to be involved in um, keeping the president up to date on what's going on abroad. Um, if he wants to carry out military action, figuring out how and where and how do we pay for it and all of that. And it became clear after 9-11 that our intelligence agencies weren't working together the way they should have. The FBI had one piece of the puzzle, the CIA had the other. Because they couldn't talk to each other, they weren't able to figure it out in time. So to try to prevent that from happening again, the government created the brand new Department of Homeland Security. Now the national intelligence agencies have to work together with each other. There's a director of national intelligence to coordinate information and report it to the president daily. They also streamlined the process by moving 22 agencies into the Department of Homeland Security. So agencies like ICE, FEMA, TSA, and Border Patrol all now fall under the Department of Homeland Security. So they wanted to make sure we wouldn't end up in the same situation as we did on 9-11. Um, and I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but if you're interested in learning more about the intelligence failures, there's the 9-11 Commission, and there's also a great mini-series on Hulu called The Looming Tower that talks about um, why we didn't put it together in time. There also tends to be disputes between the head of the CIA and the Defense Department. The CIA sometimes gets a bit trigger happy. They want to go, go, go. And the Defense Department has to say to them, look, we can't do this. Um, for example, the CIA tried at least 40 or 50 times to kill Fidel Castro. Um, and they never succeeded. I mean, at one point they were looking at sending him an exploding cigar. I mean, it was just like, what do you think you're doing? Like, it's just not, it's not gonna work. And with these conflicts, the Defense Department tends to win because they do control over 80% of the national intelligence capabilities and funds. The president wants to send troops abroad. He better get the Defense Department on board. Um, he does not want the generals coming to him and saying, we can't do this. The military also has combatant commanders assigned for every region in the world. So we can know what's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, Asia, and so on. So we have an idea of what's happening abroad. If there's going to be a coup, a civil war, um, a rise of a new terrorist group like in Boko Haram that started in Nigeria. Uh, we need to know what threats are out there and how to deal with them.
Congress, of course, is also going to get involved in foreign policy. Congress does have the power to declare a war. Um, if the president wants to go to war, Congress has to get on board. He also needs a two-thirds majority in the Senate to approve any treaties he negotiates. But this can take forever. It took us 40 years to sign the UN Convention on Genocide, which frankly should have been a no-brainer. And of course, presidents don't have 40 years to wait for Congress to sign a freaking treaty. So presidents can enter into executive agreements instead. As a reminder, an executive agreement has the weight of a treaty, but is only enforceable as long as the president is in office. So it's not permanent like a treaty. And there are two types the president can enter into. A sole executive agreement means Congress does not have to fund this agreement. So they may use it for something like an arms reduction treaty. The executive congressional agreement is where the president does submit the agreement to Congress for approval. With this, the president only needs a simple majority and not a super majority. So with an executive congressional agreement, there will be funding from Congress. So if it's a trade agreement, the president's gonna want Congress to sign off on it. There's also a variety of congressional committees. The Senate has the Foreign Relations Committee, Armed Services, Homeland Security, and Government Affairs. The House has the Foreign Affairs Committee, Homeland Security, and Armed Services. And these committees can hold hearings on foreign policy issues, like the attack on our embassy in Benghazi in 2011. They can look at things like why the 9-11 attack happened, a mass shooting, um, ISIS threats, things like that. And if someone is compelled to testify before Congress and they choose not to, Congress can hold them in contempt. And if they lie to Congress, they can also go to jail for that. Um, so they spent a lot of time talking to Secretary of State Clinton about the failures of the State Department to um, understand what would happen to our embassy. Um, because our ambassador to Libya was killed in the attack, they really wanted to try and understand what happened there. Of course, interest groups are going to get involved as well. And like their domestic counterparts, economic interest groups are more influential than human rights groups. We can lobby to try and punish China for genocide, but the interest groups that are like, look, we've got a big business relationship with China, are going to win out in that argument. If push comes to shove, we're going to look at the economic interests more than the human rights concerns. There's also religious and ethnic interest groups that have gotten involved in foreign policy. Jewish American groups like APAC have gotten involved in lobbying for a close relationship with Israel, military ties, financial ties, 
um, getting the U.S. Embassy moved to Jerusalem was quite extremely controversial. Um, basically persuading U.S. presidents not to say much about the building of illegal settlements in what is technically Palestine and so on. Um, in terms of Irish Americans, if you look at the island of Ireland, it's basically split in two. The majority of it is the Republic of Ireland. A very small section is called Northern Ireland. The Republic of Ireland is largely Catholic. Northern Ireland is considered part of the United Kingdom and is both Protestant and Catholic. Catholic Irish Americans want the two islands to be reunited. They don't like that the UK still controls part of the island. So they have been pushing for the US to try and persuade the UK to stop holding on to these six counties. Um, and there was a period of time where um, law enforcement, including firefighters and police officers in cities like New York and Boston, were sending money to a group in Northern Ireland called the Irish Republican Army or the IRA. The IRA was responsible for carrying out attacks on Protestants, including blowing up um, buses, pubs, and so on. After 9-11, that stopped. Um, but the U.S. government has been trying to push for some kind of settlement, um, some kind of agreement on what to do about Northern Ireland. Now, there are some influential human rights groups. Amnesty International is very successful. Um, they expose human rights abuses and shame regimes into changing their behavior. If a journalist is being tortured in Egypt, Amnesty International will basically harass them until they finally agree to let that journalist go. So they will call out a country for violating human rights um, and try to force countries to stop behaving so badly, um, getting people released from jail and so on. There's also environmental groups like Greenpeace, um, the Sierra Club and the NRDC. Again, not as successful because they're going up against economic groups that are just more powerful. And then we've got the role of public opinion during a war. The longer a war drags on and the higher the casualty rates, the less support there is for a war. We like the idea of a quick in and out type of war. So the first Gulf War, there were high levels of support because it took less than two years, the casualty rate wasn't high, and we were successful. Vietnam, not so much. Iraq and Afghanistan, less support compared to when they started. Um, a lot of pressure from the American people saying, we can't keep spending time here, we've got to get out of here. Um, so the longer the war drags on, the more pressure there is on the government to find a way out of it. Um, figure out how to end the war. Um, get out while we can. In terms of foreign policy overall, and the key players are going to vary. If we're looking at economic policy, then corporations are going to come into play. If we're looking at human rights, then groups like Amnesty International will come into play. If we're looking at a military intervention, then you're going to get the Defense Department involved. So the type of policy will determine who's going to be involved. When the president is going to have the most power and influence during a time of crisis. Right after 9-11, Congress
Congress was pretty much willing to authorize anything the president wanted. He grounded the planes, no problem. Creation of TSA, fine. Homeland Security, Patriot Act, no problem. Um, there was very, very little opposition to the policies that were created immediately after 9-11. For the most part, people just wanted to feel safe. And because the president had such high support from the public, Congress went along with it. So in the aftermath of a terror attack or something like a mass shooting, this is when the president can have the most influence on policy. Um, it was damn near unanimous passage to go to war against Afghanistan after 9-11. Um, people are not going to challenge the president when we're still in shock. And we are seeing more interest groups and non-formal players getting involved. Foreign policy these days is less focused on other countries and more focused on various actors and groups. So we are seeing terrorism experts becoming more involved in policy making, uh, more discussions on how we approach issues like Islamic fundamentalism, um, mass shootings, and so on. And the U.S. government is also influenced by other countries. Again, we're not going to go to war with China. We've got too much trade with them. Same with Saudi Arabia. We're not going to go after our biggest trading partners and allies. I don't see us going to war with the UK anytime soon, right? That's just not likely to happen. And sometimes we can be persuaded by other countries to take a different path. Maybe the government of France convinces us um, not to bomb a certain area or to get involved in a certain um, movement. And so this ties into what's called the democratic peace theory. And the idea behind this is that two democracies won't go to war with each other. Now, obviously, there are some exceptions, but by and large, that is true, right? We're not going to war with the UK or France or uh, Germany. If we're going to go to war, it's probably going to be something like Iran, North Korea. It's not going to be one of our biggest allies. Uh, we're not going to suddenly decide to bomb um, Beijing, that would not end very well for us. Um, so we are sometimes limited in what we can do because of all the other countries we interact with. The world is shrinking in some ways. We can't just do whatever we want anymore. Um, we do have to think about the ramifications of our policy choices. All right, any questions, comments? No? Okay. Um, so Thursday is the last day of class, essentially, because next week is finals. We will wrap up Chapter 18 on Thursday, talk about diplomacy and other foreign policy areas. Next week, um, what we'll do is we'll meet during our scheduled class time, you guys on Tuesday, the other half on Thursday. Um, I'll show you guys a brief documentary, have a little discussion, and then we'll be done for the semester. So remember, for you guys, your exam is due a week from today. Um, the Thursday cohort, your exam will be due a week from Thursday. Um, here in Blackboard, if for some reason the Dropbox doesn't work, just let me know. Um, and of course, if you have any questions on the final, you can email me or call or text me. Again, it's the same format as the midterm, four short essay questions, a page to a page and a half per question, double spaced, cite anything that is in the book or the notes. Okay, any questions on the final? Okay. Um, so again, if you have any questions, feel free to let me 